boy, it's really great to be back. It's so cool to see so many people in this room that are good friends, that are uh, people that I've been to church with, people that lived when I lived in Wilmington. Uh, my wife and I have been here for a long time, and of course my mom and my brother are still here. Uh, my father's down in Myrtle Beach, so it's always great to come back to Wilmington. Um, we moved to Boone in 2010, where we started this ministry that uh, you heard Mr. Warwick talk about. Um, we're going to share a little bit of that with you. How many of you guys were Georgia fans last night disappointed? Okay, we got Georgia disappointed fans in here. How, how, many, how many Roll Tide, real Roll Tide fans, not yeah. hanger on a Roll Tide fans? Real, okay, we got a couple of real ones in here. So how bad is it when a guy wins five out of nine, what is it, five out of eight or something like that, championships, and his starting quarterback who's 24 and two doesn't get it done, and he pulls a kid that's never played in the game before that comes in and wins the game for him? tell you a little story. When I was at the University of New Mexico, we were playing Brigham Young University at BYU, and uh, Jim McMahon was the quarterback at the time. And uh, Jim, of course, went on to win the Super Bowl with the Bears in 85. And uh, So he was an All-American that year, had thrown 48 touchdowns, and was beat out by Herschel Walker for, the, for uh, the Heisman Trophy that year. So they were trying really hard to get him a Heisman. So every time they got inside the five, they would throw the ball because they wanted him to throw touchdowns and not, not run anything in to give them all the pub. But uh, we had an All-American defensive end in the first quarter that knocked him out, took him out of the game, and we're thinking to ourselves, wow, this is great. We got McMahon out of the game. We're in really good shape. We're playing up at Provo. We can beat these guys on the road. Well, their backup quarterback comes uh, trotting in, and he's a left-handed guy. never seen him before, number eight. And uh, he drops back about five yards and throws a 40-yard strike down the sidelines. Absolutely perfect. In fact, he threw a better ball than Jim did, so we were all hoping Jim would come back in the game after that. <laughs> well, it turned out to be Steve Young that day. And Steve had his way with us. He was that guy, that backup that nobody had ever heard of. So never, never sell the backup short, because the backup's the guy who's working his tail off all the time looking for the opportunity. And I've been listening to shows all morning uh, coming out here in my car about, you know, who this guy was, uh, this Tua gentleman, and apparently he's been wowing him at Alabama in practice for about a year and a half. So uh, this isn't a surprise to Alabama fans that this kid can throw the ball. So it just goes to show that whether you're an underdog or not, or whether anybody knows your name, the bottom line is when you put the work in and uh, when you get your opportunity, you take it, and he did. So uh, that's, that's sports, right? That's how it works. Um, it's really cool to see so many people in here. Last time I was here, I think it was maybe half of this crowd. So it's exciting to see what God's doing here for you guys. Um, this, this is so important, uh, this, this group of men in here. Uh, you know, women have this all the time. My wife, she goes to every Bible study available. I mean, she, she loves to study, and women, they go in there, and they just tell it all, and they come out feeling good about themselves. But men, we're too good for that. You know, we're, we got everything under control, and we don't want anybody to know that we might have a problem, or we might have a struggle, or we might have a situation that we're not, uh, you know, equipped to handle. So, you know, I hope that you guys are taking advantage of the friendships in here, of the Christian brother in here, the prayer in here. Um, you, we got to have it as men. It's absolutely critical. In fact, uh, I belong to a group just like this. It meets Tuesday morning at Chitola Resort up in Boone, uh, about... 7.30 in the morning for an hour, we have breakfast, and uh, we, have, we have speakers come in, and we have prayer, and we uh, really tight group of men, and I have come to love these guys uh, because they have surrounded me with prayer and, and, and supported my ministry, and uh, some of you in here support our ministry, Sold Out Youth Ministries, which we've been doing since 2003. Uh, how, many, how many of you guys enjoyed your Christmas? You got, a, you got a bunch of gifts, you know, good stuff. You can tell me about all the good gifts you got. Isn't that weird how Christmas works, though, as Christians, that, you know, the thing we really should be celebrating, but we're always talking about, well, what did you get, right? I mean, and we kind of list off what we get. And I heard something in church on Sunday. One of our pastors was up there, and he said, you know, the next time somebody asks you what you got for Christmas, you need to turn to that person and say, you know what? I, I got the power to overcome the world. And the power to overcome the world comes from Jesus Christ, and that's what Christmas is all about. And I hope that everybody in here had a great Christmas, but most of all, I hope that all of us in here, because we can truly count our blessings, uh, all of us in here have something to be thankful for. All of us in here uh, have the opportunity to influence others for Christ. You know, when I started our ministry in 2003, my goal was very simple. Uh, it was to influence people for Christ. 
It was to go to the places that people would never go. It was to go to uh, people who would never go to church. It was to go to schools in public schools where the enemy is rampant and have an opportunity to impact kids with biblical principles, what we call biblical principles, and schools call life skills. My other goal was to go around the world. Uh, we go to El Salvador. Uh, we'll be going in March, speaking to schools in some of the poorest areas of San Salvador, having the opportunity to influence kids that will never have the opportunity that our young people have to, uh, to, to change. Some of them will never have the hope. We give it to them, but we know in that country, it's a different kind of situation. Uh, I tell students all the time when I go into schools, you know, you guys freely walk into this school, you wear what you want to wear, you got your cell phone, when you get out of school, you walk outside, get on the bus, or you have a parent pick you up. Uh, when you go to San Salvador, you go into a school, and it'll be an eight-foot cement wall with barbed wire around the top, an iron door in the front surrounded by two guys with M16 rifles, because the K-38 gang there pretty much runs it and kids can't cross the street. They can't be out at dark. I mean, it's a situation where it's life and death every day for these kids. So when you talk to them about the love of Christ in a, in a communist country, you have, you have kids that, are, uh, that, that want to hear the gospel because they know that it truly does mean a life could be taken that day and it could be theirs. Uh, so in our schools today, we may not have that big of emergency physically, but I'll tell you what we do have. We have a lot of kids in our schools today and a lot of young people that have lost hope. A lot of kids that don't think that the American dream's for them. A lot of kids out there who are afraid of failure. A lot of kids out there who don't know what it means to sacrifice, dedicate yourself, and work hard, all those things that we learned in school. So it's really important that we be praying for our young people, that we be praying for our schools. Um, one of the cool things in my program is I've traveled to schools all over North Carolina, Tennessee, our programs in Western Michigan. We're getting ready to go into Los Angeles, California, to Houston, Texas. But I've been in schools now for six years here in North Carolina, junior highs and high schools, visiting with principals, teachers, coaches, administrators. I can tell you that we've got a committed group, for the most part, of teachers and coaches and principals who love these kids, but their hands are tied by a testing curriculum. Their hands are tied by not being able to discipline kids. Their hands are tied uh, because we've eliminated programs like life skills, health and PE, physical fitness, programs that are absolutely essential to the development of a young person's ability, physically, mentally, emotionally, and I'll throw that other word in there, spiritually. Because we all know that hope without an object is really no hope at all. So my goal when we go into these schools is to love these kids is to show them that they do have God-given ability and the potential to reach it. And they do have the tools, if they're willing to do the tough things, if they're willing to learn those skills that all of us learned in here, things like hard work, choosing the right friends, dealing with peer pressure, setting goals, all those things that we think are trivial because we got them throughout our life, whether it was through school or sports. But these kids today, they don't get that. Uh, I have a lot of kids who write me in my program who said, you know, thanks for sharing how to set goals. I've never done that before. I've never heard of setting goals. What do you mean? So you're, we're teaching kids skills that are absolutely essential to their success moving forward. How many of you guys are fathers in here? Okay, fathers in here. We got a bunch. Okay, grandfathers in here. Grandfathers. I got six from age one to six, and I know several of you guys that have several grandchildren. What world do you want your grandchildren to grow up in? Do you want your grandchildren to grow up in a world that's godless? Do you want your grandchildren to grow up in a world where there's no black and white? Do you want your grandchildren to grow in a world where godless people are indoctrinating them in kindergarten? Or do you want your grandchildren to grow up in a world where they know that God loves them, where they know that they are a child of God, where they know that their God-given abilities are given by somebody, where they know that right and wrong exist? where they know that there's a savior that died for their sins, just like he did for us. That's the battle we're in, gentlemen. That's the battle we're in right now. We're not taking it seriously. When I talk to people up on the hill, when I talk to people in Raleigh, when I talk to officials, they're throwing money at things, but they don't understand what the real problem is. You guys know what I'm talking about. My hometown, Wilmington, North Carolina, the number one opiate county in the United States of America? Are you kidding me? 
Wilmington, North Carolina. So the question is in this room, is what can we do about it? What I'd like to do very quickly is, is I'd like to share with you a two minute video, and it's a video of what we do when we go into public schools, because I'd like you to see what we do. Our cards are in the back at that table in the back, has all of our information. If you want to pray for our ministry, if you want to give to our ministry, if you want to support us in any way, take a card. All of our social sites are on there. You can see for yourself where we're going. We have spoken to over a quarter million students in the state of North Carolina in the last six years. We have over 7,000 students that follow us on our website at soldouttv.com. And we also have students who have made a pledge that have stepped out in front of their fellow classmates and said, I'm not going to do drugs or alcohol. I'm going to make a commitment not just to myself, but to be accountable to my friends and to tell my parents that that's the commitment that I'm going to make. So we'll watch this two-minute video, and I'll be right back. Thanks, Western Harnett students. Remember, be sold out. Go to the poster, click on the QR code. Go to soldouttv.com to check out our Student Success 101 program. Over 190 videos of cool character stuff, all sorts of Be sold out against drugs and alcohol for your dreams and goals. It's all about understanding that at some point you have to say to yourself, hey, if I really want to do this, how serious am I about it? You're going to be alcohol absent, which means that you're not going to do drugs or alcohol. Two, you're going to hold your friends accountable to that decision because you care about it to make a turnaround and to deal with some of the issues that you know are keeping you from going where you want to go. Friends, going to the website, First Aid School, at the bottom get submit. Give us example for the young generation. For the young generation. That's why I don't drink. To make, take control of your life. I keep talking about the word intentional. Want to make that commitment? Raise your right hand. Let me know that's what you want to do. <laughs> The cool thing is, is that you have access to it 24 hours a day, 365 days a year at soldouttv.com. So our challenge to you is that sometime today, you're gonna to take your cell phone, or you're gonna go on your computer, or you're gonna go home tonight, and you're gonna check out that site for it. Go to our website, go to soldouttv.com, check out all of our platforms, our social net networking sites, sold out students on Instagram, sold out 41, the number on Twitter, and take our pledge by basically going to the poster, the poster, and then uh, putting your first name, school, and hitting submit. And of course, we want to hear from you what your opinion of our video program, our Success 101 student program. We're really fortunate and blessed that in a four-year period, we're going to speak to every student in that county and have the opportunity face-to-face to educate them on the dangers of drugs and alcohol, but more importantly, to replace it with something, not just a no, don't do it, but here's the alternative when it comes to your success plan, when it comes to your opportunity, when it comes to your ability to choose what you want for your life. Many, many of our schools today, kids are okay with being below par, not just average, but below par. It's almost like they've been taught that to be excellent and to be the best at something robs someone else of the opportunity. And that's the, one of the biggest lies that's going around in this generation of kids, is that somehow their success impacts someone else's failure. And we all know in here what it takes to be successful. You're successful business people in here, fathers, husbands, you know what it takes. But we have to teach these kids biblical principles, loving each other, understanding that God gives them their talents and abilities. Understanding that choosing your friends and the way you deal with your friends and the way you treat your friends means something. And that your passions and your goals in life can be reached, but there are ways that you do that. All successful people have a success plan. All successful people set goals. So what we're trying to teach these kids is, is to look past where they are now to understand that their future requires some success in doing things and having habits in their life today. So be praying for our ministry because we're very fortunate and blessed in this computer age to be able to reach kids on their cell phone. To be able to reach kids, rather years ago one kid might reach a couple more. Well, 
through our pledge program, through that poster, we'll hear from 60, 70, 80 kids in a 24-hour period. Kids telling me that, hey, I go home to a dad who drinks a 24-pack a day. Hey, I go home to a mom who disappears for a couple hours a day because she's a drug addict. Hey, what do I do about my brother who has a drug problem? You know, these are the kind of things that I hear from kids. Eloquent one, two, three paragraph talking to me about what they learned, about what they like to do, and about some of the things that they face in their life. So my prayer is that you would take a card in the back corner when you're done today and that you would put it on your prayer list to pray as we go into alternative schools, as we go into charter schools, as we go into Christian schools. Oh, by the way, you know, we all know that Christian schools, I always love that. When I go into a Christian school, uh, a few years back I was talking to a football team at a Christian school and I said, you know, if you don't mind, I'm going to share the gospel message with these kids. And he said, well, these guys are all Christians. It's a Christian school. I, I said, you know what? I don't know every kid's heart, but I'm going to go ahead and do that anyways. And what was cool about it is it's one of my favorite deals is all the parents are waiting to take their kids home, right? And of course, you all know the power of the gospel, right? I mean, power of God to change men's lives. Well, about six, seven kids get saved that day, and then we get a hand in the back from a mom who was there to pick up her kid who heard the gospel and got saved that day. So here's my message today to you guys. Every one of us in here is called to, to share the gospel clearly. You know, I have a lot of people, and you've heard this before, some of you guys come from Catholic background, or you come from a private background, you, you hear this a lot, you know, my, my religion's private between me and God. In a way, that's true. But God has not suggested that we share the gospel. God has not suggested that at all. That is a command from the Lord Jesus Christ in the Great Commission. When I talk to donors and when I talk to prayer partners in my ministry, the number one thing I tell them is you're going to see changed lives. That dollar that you put into our program is going to turn into changed lives because we're going to share the gospel, and if we can't do that, we're not going to do it. So whether I'm speaking at a group like this or in a church or to a men's group or to an FCA group or to a football team or to an auditorium of kids, anytime I have the opportunity to share the gospel, I'm going to do it because it changes men's lives. It changes young boys' lives. It changes girls' and uh, women's lives. It changes anyone that hears it. Some of you here, how many of you can think of at least one person in your life that needs to know Jesus in the room? At least one. Okay, how many of there are family members in the room? Family members. They're the toughest ones, right? Because they know us really well and they want to put it back off, say, I know, remember what you did when you were 10 years old, right? Yeah. Listen, the bottom line is the gospel changes people's lives. And the minute we forget that is the, is the minute that we're in trouble. And if you're involved in a church where the gospel isn't being preached, there's a really good chance it's not growing. If you're in a, a, in a place where the gospel is not being clearly submitted an opportunity and challenged to get people saved, then that's called a country club. And see, a lot of times as Christians, we think we all got it made because we got people surround us, everybody's good. Bottom line is there are people going to hell every single day. And see, that's what motivates me with what I do, is that I know that chore never ends. And see, all of you guys have a story. All of you guys have what we call a testimony. All of you guys you know, can you remember the person that brought you to Christ? I know I can. His name's Jim Brooks. Can you remember by his first name who that person is? You know who it is, right? The person who shared Christ with you. Here's our challenge, men. When I go on a college campus like Appalachian State, there are young people on that campus who have never read the Bible, and there are young people on that campus who do not know who Jesus Christ is, literally. They have grown up in a godless world, most of us in here didn't see indoctrination until we were in college. That was my case. But you could still talk to professors about Christian things and about disagreements and about your ideas. You know, if you're going to pay 40 grand for your kid to go to school, or 20 grand a year, or 100 grand over their career, you would think that open ideas would be part of college, right? Well, that's gone out the wayside. They're kicking Christian organizations off campus. I have friends that are in full-time ministry on campus. And they're not even allowed to meet on campus. So everything's used in social networking. Everything's about individual, one-on-one, -on -one, small groups. You know, finding and identifying leaders, bringing them to Christ, and then teaching them to do the same. That sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? 
kind of what Jesus did when he picked those kind of goofball guys out and they turned out to be the most powerful machine in the world. Did you ever think about that? Did you ever think about the fact that 2,000 years ago that those disciples are responsible for all of us in here? Because when Jesus told them, and that had to be a really tough day when he said, I'm going, and they're like, where are you going? Well, I'll be back. What do you mean? Where are you going? Well, you're going to share my message. You're going to be my hands, feet, and mouth. And I'm sure they looked at him and said, what? We've been following you around, just kind of basking in this. But you're asking us to make a commitment to put our lives on the line to say, hey, is this really real in my life? Or is it just something I play at? And I'm just here to tell you guys, John 3.16, all of us know that in the room. And I always tell people when people say, well, I, you know, I'm a little uncomfortable about sharing my faith. You know, I, well, I might not know a scripture. I might not say the right thing. God is not looking for talent, guys. He is looking for availability. He's looking for the person who says, and, if, and, it's, and it's all throughout the Bible, right? He's looking for people who have a heart for him, who are willing to say, I'll go. And many of you have been on mission trips in here. Many of you have gone. Many of you are going right here in your community. But imagine what would happen if this group of people in this room, just this room, were prayed up. Imagine what would happen if this group of people, every one of you guys decided, you know what, today I'm going to tell one person about Jesus. I'm going to tell one person about what God's done in my life. I'm going to pray for that one person, and I'm going to continue until God changes it. One thing about God, he's like Nick Saban in football. He delivers. You know? God is waiting for us to say, I believe the gospel so powerfully that I'm willing to put myself out on the line. And I'm challenging you guys in here today. John 3.16 is the real story about the gospel. It's easy, right? For God so loved the world, loved me, you, that he gave his only begotten son, died on the cross for my sins, took my place and yours, shed his blood, the blood that I deserve to bleed. He bled for me because he was perfect and I wasn't. That if anyone believes on his name, he should not perish but have eternal life. That there's forgiveness in Jesus Christ. How many of you guys in here could deal with this world without Jesus Christ? How many? How many could, could, you do, could anybody in here do that with the world we're living in today? You know, my wife and I talk about that all the time. We talk about the fact that could you imagine not knowing your eternity in the world that we're living in today and relying on your own wits and relying on your own wisdom and relying on your own ability to get through life. But we all remember what that's like, right? Because every one of us in here has been there, right? Every one of us has been there. But here's the problem. We forget that we've been there. And that's one of the problems that we have sometimes as Christians. We get so comfortable with this life that we even think that our whole life has been like this and we can't even remember what it was like or we don't want to. But I challenge you in your prayer time as you go forward from today, Think back and seriously think about where you were at before you met Christ. What brought you to Christ? Most of us were desperate. Most of us in the room needed a Savior. And you know what? Any person that doesn't know Jesus has a heart-shaped void in their that they need Jesus. That's the only answer for their problems. See, when I was 13 years old, I had been to church my whole life. In fact, I've been to see Billy Graham. I mean, what, a, what an incredible treat that was when I was nine to go to uh, Anaheim Stadium and see Billy Graham speak, see him give the gospel. And you know what's cool about Billy Graham is, is he didn't fluff it up. He didn't apologize for it. He didn't overdo it. He just gave the gospel just as it is and challenged people to come. And you remember how many used to come? The night I was there, thousands came out of the stadium, thousands onto that field. A lot more than a football game I'd been to when it was packed. That place was 50,000 strong, and people were coming out of the seats like you would not believe. But the thing about Billy Graham is, is he's never changed the way he did things, and he doesn't today. I saw him in his last crusade in Kansas City. Uh, it was 19, no, it was 2006, 2006. And do you know that night the music was a little hipper, the music was a little, you know, the music was changed, kind of more like young people like music today. I think there was a barbershop quartet when I was nine. I thought that was cool. <laughs> but he gave the gospel, and I'm telling you, I, my wife and I had tears in our eyes because I thought to myself, 
I would not know Jesus today without that message he gave when I was nine. Because you see, I thought that going to church, reading the Bible, being as good as you could, being nice to people, doing everything you could to, to, you know, to be a Christian person was what a Christian was. But I found out that night that that's just not it at all. Because I do not meet up. Because see, I have one sin in my life. I've sinned once. I've missed the mark once. And that once disqualified me for heaven. And when Billy Graham gave that message in that stadium, that final message, and it was exactly the same as the day I heard it, I thought to myself, why are we trying to change something that works? Why are we not relying on the power of the gospel, our most powerful weapon, offensive weapon, right? God's word, we need to be in it. We need to be prayed up. We need to be with other Christian brothers like today. We need to be going to church to fellowship with a group of believers that we all say that we believe in Jesus. But most of all, every one of us in here has the ability to share the life-changing path that God put us on. And I challenge you in here today, who was I before I met Christ? How did I meet Christ? And how am I changed? That doesn't take very long, but it can change a person's life. You know, as an evangelist, I've traveled all over this country and I've seen the power of the gospel work in every situation. I've seen people come to Christ, thousands of people come to Christ, not because of anything Roman Gabriel's done, but because I've chose to give the gospel regardless of what's going on in my life. There are many times before I come to speak to a group like this where the devil comes knocking and says, who are you to think you can get in front of these guys with all the screw-ups you've had in your life? Who are you to think that you're good enough to share the gospel? Who are you? But you know what? It's not who am I, it's who is he. You know, Reggie White, one of the greatest defensive ends uh, in, in football, and I'll finish on this. We were at a Super Bowl once, and I got to know Reggie through a good friend of the Carolina Panthers that he and I have known each other a long time. And I remember Reggie White in the church, and he was preaching to a group of young people in FCA. And he said, don't get caught up in who you are. Because see, you don't know who I really am. You think I'm the greatest defensive football player to ever play, or a Green Bay Packer, or a Super Bowl champion, but that's not who I am. I'm a Christian first, a father second, a husband second, a father third. But he said, don't get caught up in who you are, but get caught up in whose you are. And it was one of the most powerful things I've remembered the rest of my life. It's not about who you are, it's about whose you are, and whose we are is on the team of Jesus Christ. Whose we are is on the conquer. You know, on the way out here today, I was listening to Revelation uh, you know, on my, uh, my app and my phone. And it's the first time I've ever done Revelation all the way through. You know, five and a half hour drive, you can do that. But I listened to it today. And you know what I took from it? And it was a great thing because God was speaking to me to speak to you guys about today. No matter what's going on in your life, no matter how terrible things can be sometimes in this world or disappointing when people fail us or we fail others. You know what the Bible says? We've already won. We win. At the end of this deal, we win. Jesus is coming back, and he's not coming back as that sacrificed lamb. He's coming back as a champion. He's coming back on a white horse. He's coming back with a sword. And he's going to do business with the problems of the enemy. So the challenge today is this. Some of you guys in here, you do all the right things. You know, maybe you're a deacon in your church. Maybe you read your Bible every day. Maybe you pray every day. Maybe you do good deeds. You're the kind of person that people like to be around because you're consistent and you're a person who cares about other people. But all that stuff doesn't mean very much if you've never if you've never dealt with who Jesus Christ is in your life, if you've never made a decision about who Jesus Christ is in your life. My prayer today is, is that if you've never made a decision to invite Christ to be the center of your life, to forgive your sins, to give you eternal life, to be the leader in your life, to let go and to say, hey, I've been trying this my way for a long time and it's just not working, or even with Christians in the room, you've been... All of us get there, right? We get to that point where we need a kick in the butt or we need someone to get encouragement or we need to realize that, you know, we've lost that first love. We've lost that passion. I know I deal with it. Even when you're in ministry, 
I think it's harder sometimes because you're doing it as a job because of the support of people like this in this room. But if you never made a decision for Christ, it's a real simple one to make. What do we say about John 3.16? All God wants to know from you is, is are you willing to give up running the show? Are you willing to admit that you're a sinner, that you need Jesus? Are you, are you willing to turn from your sin, repent, turn to God and ask him to come in your life in the person of Jesus Christ, save your life, and to help you to be the best person, father, husband, man you can be?